This presentation will define and discuss intubation, specifically placement of an endotracheal tube, and collaborative management during placement and once the airway is placed. So intubation literally means placing a tube in someone. However, in the vast majority of contexts, we're talking about placing a tube in someone's airway and most commonly placing an endotracheal tube in their airway or an ET tube, endotracheal tube. So placement of these tubes can be done in a low stress environment or a high stress environment. For example, maybe before a planned surgery on a stable patient, sounds very low stress. Or maybe a patient who has been having a hard time breathing all shift and their oxygen saturations are dropping into the 70s and their respiratory rate is 45 and their last ABG looked absolutely terrible. Now that sounds like a high stress situation to intubate someone in. So however, regardless of the situation, it's our job as the nurse to monitor the patient and provide assistance when the patient is actually being intubated. So most commonly in the ICU setting, a physician will intubate the patient. So what do we do then? Well, we do a lot. Not only do we do basic tasks like preparing the supplies for intubation and getting the patient positioned for intubation, that often involves removing the headboard and raising the, raising the bed itself, uh, but we have a major role in administering medications and monitoring the patient during and the procedure. So many times, these patients will be provided sedation, analgesia, and even a neuromuscular blocking agent, which is a paralytic, prior to having this large tube placed down their airway. So we as nurses will often be responsible for administering those medications and clearly, clearly announcing them to the physician who will be intubating. Now, timing is key with these medications. Think about it. You don't want to give a sedative or a paralytic if the physician isn't ready to intubate because you're going to be looking at an apneic patient and a team that's not ready to breathe for the patient and it suddenly becomes more emergency situation. So during the intubation process, a few things will happen. Sometimes the physician will slip the endotracheal tube right into place on the first attempt very quickly. The end of the endotracheal tube will be attached to the bag valve mask and will begin ventilating the patient. Other times, not so simple. It can take multiple attempts, sometimes by multiple physicians. Sometimes each attempt starts to take too long. And think about this. The physician is staring down the patient's airway. What are they not looking at? They're not looking at the monitor. And what is the patient not doing because of the drugs we gave them? They're not breathing on their own. So time is of the essence. And your job as the nurse is to be very closely assessing your patient's airway, your patient's oxygenation on the monitor. And frankly, you need to be bold and you need to speak up if you notice that this specific intubation attempt is just taking too long and your patient's oxygenation saturation is dropping. You need to advocate for your patient. It's time to stop this attempt, get the bag valve mask back on the patient, bring their oxygen saturations back up, and then attempt later. But that is your job to speak up to the physician and up to the, to the healthcare team. So, once the patient is successfully intubated, we now need to verify that that tube, that ET tube, is in the correct place, meaning we're ventilating both lungs, not just one, and we're not ventilating the stomach. So we need to listen to both lungs, and often we need to make sure that the ET tube is in the right place. We can actually quickly listen to the wrong place, so we listen to the stomach. So this way, if I hear loud bubbling when we bag the patient, we know we're in the wrong spot. We know we're just pushing air into a patient's stomach. The tube is in the stomach. We need to take it out, ventilate the patient, and reattempt an intubation again. Now, a CO2 detector, that purple or yellow detector that you've seen before, or even capnography, which can trend on the monitor, those can be connected to the endotracheal tube to determine if the tube is in the lungs as well. But ultimately, a chest X-ray is going to tell you where the tube is lying. So. Let's say the tube is in the right place. We have bilateral chest rise. Oxygen saturations are increasing up to 94%. We're feeling good about this intubation. What now? Well, the tube needs to be secured. Remember, just because it's in the right place now does not mean, mean that it can't move. So it needs to be secured to the patient. But we also need to see where it's secured. So you'll see these little markings on the endotracheal tube itself.
So we can actually identify how deep the tube is for the specific patient. Remember, every patient is a different size. Some patients' tubes will need to be deeper. Some patients' tubes will need to be more shallow. But this is something you as the nurse need to document in the chart. So for example, size 7 endotracheal tube taped at 22 centimeters at the lip. And then the nurse, let's say the night nurse that you just gave report to and you told ET tube, seven, size 7 ET tube taped at 22 centimeters, that night nurse should now be able to walk in the room, look at the tube, and sure enough, the patient's lip is touching the tube at that little 22 mark. Now last, the respiratory therapist will commonly inflate what is called the cuff. And this is basically a little balloon that surrounds the bottom of the ET tube. It doesn't block the ET tube, it's kind of hugging the bottom of the ET tube. And it prevents air from escaping out the mouth. So since the cuff itself is way down in the trachea, we can't really see it. We can't tell if it's underinflated or overinflated. So we need something called a pilot balloon. And the pilot balloon is a little balloon that actually ends up hanging outside the patient's mouth. And it has a tube connected to that cuff that's deep inside our patient. And it basically gives us a little idea of how inflated the balloon is. So you can see there's quite a bit that goes on with just this initial intubation process. So this picture just shows an image of how uh, the ET tube is commonly secured. Remember we talked about how there's a lot of secretions in there. The patient may wake up, may wiggle it around with their tongue. They may turn over in bed and it gets dislodged. So we need to make sure it's very well secured. So you can see here that this is how the respiratory therapist may secure the tube, but there are some other devices that I'll show on the next slide. So here are some other devices that have been invented rather than just using tape. You may see these as well. Um, a lot of times the key thing to remember with any kind of device or tape that's securing the tube is these can frankly get a little bit gross. You have secretions here, you may have blood on them, and where is all of that stuff going to slowly travel? Down the tube and into the patient's lungs. So these need to be kept clean, but even more importantly than preventing infection and pneumonia is that the tube is secure. Infection falls very low on the totem pole when you have a patient who's not breathing. That's priority number one. So whenever you walk into your patient's room that has a ventilator, that has an ET tube, it's being secured, you are assessing that site. You're making sure that A, it's taped or secured at the right number of centimeters. So remember the tube is as deep as it should be or as shallow as it should be, and that it's not moving around. Now one of the ways to keep the tube from moving around is keeping your patient comfortably sedated. So patients who are on the ventilator should receive some sort of sedation. Very rarely you'll see a patient who does not require sedation, but much more commonly patients will be sedated on a continuous drip so that they don't wake up and find this tube in their mouth and want to take it out. Now if a patient is weaning off the ventilator, meaning we're trying to get them off the ventilator, that's a different story. But in general, we want to have a very secure airway. We don't want that tube to come out because that creates an emergency. So another key concept related to intubation is what's called proper cuff inflation. Now we've discussed how once an endotracheal tube is placed that it needs to be secured and the respiratory therapist will inflate the cuff. Well, let's take this a little bit further and take a closer look here. So at figure A, you can see where the cuff is located on the endotracheal tube. It's very distal to what we see hanging out of the patient's mouth, right? Now, looking at images B and C, you can see how and why that cuff is so important. Imagine if there were no cuff, if the tube was just sitting in the trachea. Air would be delivered through that tube, but it could escape right back up and around the tube and out of the patient's mouth. So the cuff prevents air from sneaking back out of the trachea and allows the air delivered through the endotracheal tube to go down into the lungs. If air is allowed to go back up and around that tube and out the mouth, we actually call this an air leak. So another benefit to these cuffs is that they reduce risk of aspiration. So normally when we're not intubated, we swallow oral secretions without even thinking about it. However, in this patient, we've bypassed their epiglottis, their normal eating and breathing mechanisms. So they can't swallow anymore. So all of these secretions are now potentially gonna get dumped into the lungs. However, this cuff also prevents a lot of that from happening. Just remember that now all of those secretions are just sitting on top of the cuff now.
So back to proper cuff inflation, you can see why an underinflated cuff will allow those secretions to dump into the lungs and also allow for an air leak, so not very efficient ventilation. However, we don't want to have a cuff that's overinflated either. That will now put a lot of pressure on the tissue inside the trachea. So it could potentially cause tracheal ischemia or even necrosis. And if it's super tight, the cuff could eventually rupture. And now we have a huge air leak and we really just need to replace the endotracheal tube, which is quite a process. So in order to avoid all these underinflation and overinflation problems, Respiratory therapists and sometimes nurses will check the pressure in the cuff itself using something called a manometer. And you can actually see that device here in blue. So we can really look at the pilot balloon as well if we're not using a manometer. Remember the pilot balloon is connected to the cuff and kind of gives us an idea of what's going on down below when we can't see. So what I'll do is just touch it with my fingers, kind of pinch it and think, okay, is it really, really tight? Hmm, I think my cuff might be overinflated. So it's time to talk with my respiratory therapist about potentially needing to take some air out, checking the pressure. And then maybe I go in the next time and the pilot balloon is almost flat and it's really underinflated. Now it seems like we could have an underinflated cuff and maybe potential for air leak. So now we have an endotracheal tube that is in the trachea. We've made sure the cuff is inflated appropriately, and we've made sure it's secured appropriately. But the next most important thing we need to do is make sure that it's at the right location in terms of is it too far in or too far out. This can be accomplished using a chest x-ray. So the second a patient is intubated, we're ordering a chest x-ray, usually a stat portable chest x-ray where somebody comes in the room and checks. From that chest x-ray, we can see is the tube too far in or too far out, but the appropriate placement is three to four centimeters above that carina. Remember, if that ET tube was in too far, it could have either all the right, gone all the way into the right main stem, or it could be hitting the carina, constantly making the patient cough. So in the x-ray, you can actually see the tip of the endotracheal tube, and it should measure about three to four centimeters above the carina. In that chest x-ray, the radiologist may say, uh, recommend adjusting the ET tube by bringing it out two centimeters and the respiratory therapist will go in the room, readjust the endotracheal tube and get another chest x-ray ordered. So any client who is intubated gets a chest x-ray. Also, any client who's intubated should have a chest x-ray every single day to make sure that it's staying in the right place. Remember we talked about how these patients can move around, they have a lot of secretions, there's a lot going on. These tubes can move around and we need to make sure that they're staying in the right place. We're also documenting what the right place is. So the size of the tube is important. A small size would be like a size six for adults, which has a very small diameter or a small lumen versus a size eight and a half or a nine is a much larger lumen. So this is gonna be according to what the physician feels appropriate when the patient's being intubated. But again, a larger lumen usually is for a larger framed person and vice versa. As the nurse, we should also be documenting the placement. So that centimeters deep that the tube is, that we've confirmed by chest x-ray, it's in the right spot. So we really don't want that tube to move. We're gonna secure it appropriately and then document the actual amount of centimeters in that the tube is. And the way we do this is we look at those markings on the tube and where does the lip touch those markings? So I might say 23 centimeters at the lip. It is uh, commonplace in some areas for people to say at the teeth. This isn't usually as common now, but you may hear 22 centimeters at the teeth instead. So that's where the teeth are touching the tube. But obviously it's a little easier just to look at the lip and where the lip is touching the tube. Then, of course, we need to know what the settings are for the ventilator, and it's also our job as the nurse to be aware if an ABG has not been done recently, if we feel it's appropriate this time, we've gotta be keeping our eye on that as well. So this device should look familiar to you from when you learned about codes. As you know, we can play this, place this on top of the ET tube to see if it's in the right place. Remember, it'll turn yellow if CO2 is detected, so yellow means yes, but if it does not turn yellow and stays purple, then that is a problem. So just a little reminder here of something else we can use to make sure the tube is in the right place. So another way and a much more specific way we can detect carbon dioxide and making sure that the placement is good is hooking the patient up to capnography. And this will actually be shown up on the monitor on a screen. 
to show us what the average capnography is or the average amount of CO2 is when the patient's breathing. As you'll see, it'll come in waves, so it'll go higher when the patient's exhaling and lower when the patient's inhaling. But a good number is the same as with your ABGs, so 35 to 45. And as you may recall, with code blue situations, capnography is helpful because it tells us how effective our compressions are. So this can be used in a couple of different environments. So as you've been learning about intubation and care of the intubated patient, you've probably gathered that there's a lot that could go wrong here. And as you see here, this is just a few of the problems. But one of the easiest things to do is for esophageal intubation. So when the physician is intubating the patient, they may miss the trachea and go into the stomach. Ideally, this is something we catch much earlier than later on. We catch it immediately because we listen to the stomach. The other complication with the process of intubation is right main stem intubation where the tube is pushed in a little too far and rather than hitting the carina, it just kind of slides into the right main stem because that's easier to slide into than the left main stem. Because Intubation can happen during very stressful and honestly traumatic situations. Sometimes those intubating the patients can be quite aggressive. Sometimes this is necessary, but it can lead to structural injury, um, damage to the trachea, damage to the vocal cords, um, even breaking of teeth. So we need to be aware that these are possibilities that can happen with the patient who's being intubated. One of the most unfortunate things that can happen on your shift as an ICU nurse is an unplanned extubation. You are taking care of a patient who is intubated on the ventilator, everything's going well, and then for whatever reason they wake up and they don't know where they are and they find this really uncomfortable tube in their mouth and they pull it out. Or maybe a patient is covered in tubes, very, very busy patient, very sick, a lot going on. The patient's rolled over in bed and the tube was not secured appropriately and the tube comes out. As you can imagine, this is an emergency. You have just lost your secure airway. So this is definitely one of the complications that can occur if somebody's intubated is losing the intubation. We talked about briefly with the securement devices that intubation can be very dirty. There's a lot of germs in the mouth, there's saliva, other secretions in the mouth. Those secretions can drop down into the lungs instead of swallowed in the stomach, which is normal for you and I can go down into the lungs and cause an infection or cause aspiration pneumonia. So we need to be keeping these patients propped up at at least 30 degrees for the head of the bed and watching to make sure that the mouth is very clean so that if there is bacteria in there, we are at least cleaning it out so that it's not dropping down into the lungs. So as you can tell, there's a lot that goes into taking care of a patient with an endotracheal tube, but this is just main information that I want you to be aware of before we get into what happens now that they have an ET tube when we connect them to the ventilator. How do we set up this machine to breathe for them? So I welcome your questions on the discussion board, but we'll be briefly discussing this in class to make sure that everything's clear. So continue doing your reading and I'll see you in class.